And next, we will have Mr. Ajay Singh Kapoor, Global Equity Strategies from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, in the session. It's about emerging market growth outlook. Ajay has 27 years of experience, predominantly based in Hong Kong as a strategist, covering Asia and also global equity markets across both and both buy and sell side. He has one of the most highly regarded franchise in equity strategy and also has been consistently top three rated in the range of major global and Asian external surveys over the years. Prior to joining Bank of America, Murray Lynch, I just served as head of Asia strategy at Deutsche Bank, which he joined in 2010. Prior to Deutsche, AJ held senior equity strategy roles in Mira Asset and Citigroup. Why a Citigroup? He wrote extensively an economic with significant income and wealth in equalities under the Ambara terms plutonomy. Other innovative work produced by the team includes concepts like risk and love, the demi Ashton ratio, and free liquidity. All right. I think Mr. Ajay is now ready, right? So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Ajay. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ajay Kapoor. I'm the Asia Pack and Emerging Markets Equity Strategist. It's really a privilege to be here uh, to share some ideas with you. Um, I'll talk for about 30 minutes or so. Uh, and I want to really talk about two things. One is uh, why I'm so bullish on Asia uh, and emerging markets in terms of the equity markets. Uh, I, I want to talk maybe briefly about China. A lot of people are worried about it. Uh, I'm not really that concerned about it. Uh, I'll talk briefly about Thailand uh, and what's going right and what's going wrong. Um, and I'll also talk a little bit about global inflation because that's very important when you think about uh, what the Fed's going to do, what the central banks are going to do. So really those three subjects. All right, let's uh, get right into it. So why bullish on Asia and emerging markets? I'm going to show you a lot of pictures, um, and uh, I'll try to simplify them because some of them, uh, some of them are complicated. So this is simply a valuation for Asian equities. And the blue line high, meaning equities are expensive. Uh, blue line low, meaning they're cheap. It's somewhere in the middle. Uh, this is a price to book. We can look at PEs. We can look at other valuation metrics. Bottom line is uh, we're fairly valued in Asia X Japan and also fairly valued in emerging markets. Last February, if you remember, that blue line was very low. Uh, yeah, that's when we were cheap. But I, I can tell you, you know, I've done this business now for about almost 30 years. Uh, people do not like to buy cheap markets. They, they only like to buy when it's very expensive. Uh, and that's just the way human beings are. I know it looks very simple, um, but it's not. Uh, and I know that when this blue line is very, very high, I'll probably be saying what I always say, hey, it's very high, it's quite expensive, very risky. Um, and uh, most of the feedback will be, yeah, yeah, but it's going to go higher. So, um, so that's just human nature. Uh, this is the, the central bank balance sheet. So I think I know a lot of us pay a lot of attention to geopolitics because we've all got our Blackberries and our iPhones in our hands, and we're constantly looking at this, a little bit Instagram, a little bit Pinterest, a little bit CNN. You know, there's constant information on politics. And uh, I, politics should be like your stamp collection, sort of interesting, but it shouldn't interfere with your portfolio, all right? I love my stamp collection, yeah? even though uh, yeah, it was a long time ago. But I, I don't let my stamp collection interfere with you know, what I'm doing with my portfolio. Politics is the same. Interesting, but keep it to one side. What you should focus on is what central banks are doing. So this bar chart is simply the amount of liquidity that the big four central banks are putting into the system and are likely to. So as long as this blue line is rising or not falling, we're OK. And the good news is that the BOJ, the Central Bank of Japan, the ECB in Europe, are still printing a lot of new money, They're buying bonds and other assets. The Fed says that they will be cutting down, but ever so slowly. And I have my doubts even about that, which I will come to later. 
Uh, how about growth? Now, you know, as you know, Asia, X, Japan, a big exporting region. We rely on global growth. This blue line simply tells me that the percentage of countries in the world that are in an economic expansion is about 85% of them. See, that blue line is quite high. It can remain high for many years, like 02 to 07, it just remained very, very high. So we like an expanding global economy. I'm not saying the global economy is very strong. What I'm saying is almost everybody is growing at the same time, and, and that's very good news. This is another chart. This comes from my colleague, Nigel Tupper, who's our head of global quantitative analysis. Line high, meaning global economy is strong. Don't ask me what's in it. It's, it's very long. It's too much stuff. Basically, line high, global economy strong. Line low, global economy weak. You can see global economy is quite strong. Um, let's talk about earnings, because in Thailand, the earnings numbers are not that good. In fact, that's a, a problem for most of Southeast Asia. Um, so let's look at some leading indicators of earnings. Uh, this is the yellow line is simply global trade. And you can see the yellow line leads Asian earnings, which is in blue, by about six months. So global trade has begun to pick up because almost every country in the world is growing quite nicely. And that means our earnings numbers are going to be pretty good. And this is one of my favorite charts. It's actually very simple. This, this line is every year we ask analysts in the world, what are earnings going to do? You're an MBA or a CFA, a very smart person, you get paid a lot of money, and we want you to answer the simple question, what are earnings going to do? So a lot of late evenings at the office, typing away big spreadsheets, a lot of intellectual power. The answer is always the same, between 10 to 13%. I figure I'm a lazy guy. I don't need to work that hard. I can, if you ask me to say a number between 10 and 13, like that, 12 and a half, no work required. Now, now you can see that's, the, that's how the earnings growth is starts, right? It's at 13, 14, but the end of the year, it's much lower. That's what's happened the last five years. This green line is for this year. This is different. For the first time in six years, the analyst said 10 to 12, the number now is about 20 plus. So that's a good positive surprise, and I think that's going to continue. So next year in red, again, it's between 10 to 12. I don't even need to look at it. I know it's between 10 to 12. What I need to figure out is, is it going to be higher or lower? And my assessment is going to be higher because the world economy is, uh, is broadly strong. Global trade is strong. Right, the PMIs are rising, uh, commodity prices are rising. So we, we have a good idea what this red line is going to be doing, it should be rising. Let me switch gears now a little bit to the longer term, to the sustainability of growth. Now all these bars are simply the change in capital investment. So you can see your own country, Thailand, is to the far right. Capital investment of GDP has gone down here by about 5% of GDP in the last five years. Uh, my country is a champion, uh, cut back, uh, India, uh, CapEx by about 8.5% or so. Uh, most countries have cut back CapEx. Now, if you're an economist, you don't like this. You'll complain. Oh, there's not enough in investment spending. What's going on? We need us bad for productivity. I'm a strategist. I don't really care about this stuff. What I, what I like is I don't like capital investment spending. Because if, if I set up a steel plant, I'll make a lot of money. If all of you also set up a steel plant in this room, then none of us is going to make money. So I'd rather you don't set up a steel plant. I want to be the only monopoly steel plant, right? It's very simple. Uh, as, a, as a strategist, as someone who wants to make money. So this is good. No, no one's setting up steel plants. In fact, they're shutting them down. That's what those blue bars going down means, OK? So that's actually very good news. That's happening around the world. It's bad for the economy. I, I, you know, I don't dispute that. It's bad for economies, not creating jobs. I, I understand. If you're a politician, you want these lines to go up. But I'm not an economist or a politician. So what's the impact of this? Let me prove it to you. Look at the lower chart, Brazil. So the, the blue line's going up. That means capital investment is going down. I've, I've flipped it around, right? The yellow line is margins, EBIT margins. So you can see. The, as the capital investment has gone down, as I said, the line's reversed, the margins are going to go up. Same thing for China. So blue line going up means fewer steel plants. You have to just, if you're Brazilian, show up for work, you know, run your steel plant, you'll make a lot of money. So this is how the cycles work. If you remember Thailand, 1997, I was around. I remember. Um, I'll show you some charts later on. There's just too much investment in this country. 
big current account deficit, obviously margins went down. So me, I prefer low investment. The good news is no one's doing investment. I love that. The, the other good news from a short run basis is if you don't invest money in CapEx, you have a lot of free cash flow, right? So this is operating income, it's going up. Let's assume that's right. Capital investment is in yellow. You can see it's coming down. Next year. So one minus the other. Operating income, $50. Yeah. CapEx, $10. Free cash flow, $40. 50 minus 10. So that's this chart. So the free cash flow is going to be massive in, in Asia. This is my money. I'm the shareholder. Either I want it in a dividend, special dividend, share buyback. You can do some M&A if you want. But free cash flow is picking up very dramatically. All right. Again, because there's no capex. So that's, again, very good news. So less capex means in the long term, higher margins. In the short term, money in your pocket. Now, what is the free cash flow yield? It's about 6% of sales. This is our projection for next year. You can see in Asia, that's the highest since 2002. That's a lot of free cash flow. So you're already seeing this in, in the basic material sector. You know, companies um, from Australia uh, giving you higher dividends in Korea, special dividend. So this is going to continue for some time. Now, I know Thailand has very delicious mangoes. So where I come from, India, we, our mangoes are also very, very good. So uh, what I'm, my mother taught me how to look at a mango uh, and uh, figure out whether it's a juicy mango or not. And the tricks are you smell it, I'm sure you, you, you know this, and you press the point of the mango. And if it's sort of firm but soft, then you know it's a good one, right? So for, uh, for companies, how juicy is the mango is how high is the free cash flow. So I'm saying the blue line is high. It's a very juicy mango. And of course, my mother also taught me don't overpay for mangoes. You must bargain, yes? Um, you can't do that in supermarkets, but uh, you, know, you can do it if there's a vendor. So how, how expensive is this juicy mango? That's the yellow line. It's very cheap. So remember this, Asian equities, juicy mango, very cheap. Yeah? How, <laughs> the, the last time that happened was in 02. In 2002, you can see the blue line was very high, juicy mango, yellow line very low, very cheap. So I'm presenting to you a, a juicy mango that's very reasonably valued. That's the way to think about it. Okay? How, how about making a mistake? If you go at 92, look at the red bar. That mango, 92, the blue line is very low, hardly any free, negative free cash. It's a, it's a dried up, terrible mango that you paid a lot of money for. We don't want that. We, we want where we are right now. OK, so let's switch to the dollar now. Now, dollar is in yellow. I flipped it around, so when the yellow line is going down, the dollar is very strong. And I can tell you this. Whenever the dollar is strong, normally in Asia and emerging markets, we have a financial crisis. So you look at the early 80s. Many of you remember the 1997 crisis in Thailand and Asia, but there was also a big crisis in this part of the world in 1982, from 82 to 85, driven by the strong dollar. So this time around, the dollar is up about 40%, yellow line coming down in real terms. But uh, there's no crisis. It's all pretty good. So something has changed. Normally, we don't like a, a strong dollar. Um, and and some, that's something that's changed is the, the, the fundamentals, whether it's Thailand, whether it's the other Asian countries, are very, very strong. And I want to talk a bit about that. This is the 20th anniversary of my financial vulnerability models. Um, the higher these lines, the more vulnerable you are to a blow up. The lower these lines, the safer you are. And I'll tell you what goes into this. But for now, just, just absorb the chart. You can see the early 90s, the lines are very high for a very long time. Yeah, the, is the, that was the East Asian miracle right before it blew up. Yeah. So they were very sick, arteries were clogged up, ready for a heart attack. And yes, there was a heart attack in 97. June 4th, 97. I remember it quite well. I'm sure many of you also remember it very well. So when the lines are high, a heart attack is about to happen. Lines are low, it's very good. You've been working out, you're healthy. That's what's going on right now. So what goes into that? What, let's, let's see what goes into it. 
So first is, length. I won't go through all the, the metrics, but some of the few important ones are, I don't like it when there's too much loan growth. Um, even though I work for a bank. Um, if you have too many years of very strong loan growth, some bad loans would have been made for sure. Um, and so you look at the early 90s, the left-hand side of the chart, this is a very strong loan growth. And then, of course, by 97, we had a problem. You look at the last five, six years, there's hardly any loan growth. It's awesome. It's great. Because if you don't lend too much money, you couldn't have made too many stupid decisions. All right? And I, I have proof for that. So this is the gap between loan growth and industrial production growth. So if you're a banker and in the last three years you have increased loans by 100% and the economy has grown only 10%, what happened to the other 90%? Who would you lend money to? Some guys are not going to pay it back. So that's what we, we call it the bad loan growth proxy. We look at total loans minus what the economy is doing. That's our, our sign for bad loans. That's also gone down. So we, we really, really like this, that the banking systems, for the most part, have not done stupid stuff. We, we like that. How about the currencies? So if you, if you think about this line, when you're very high, your currency is very strong. So go back to 97, Asian financial crisis. So most Asian currencies, most EM currencies are very expensive. When that line is high, you're expensive. Right? So you have the Asian financial crisis, you have the GFC, currencies are expensive. China nominal growth peak, that's when the Brazilian real was very expensive. And then last February, our currencies became very competitive. That's when everybody gave up on these markets because China was going to blow up. I remember that very well. You couldn't get people to buy this stuff. Could not, difficult. I told you people don't like to buy cheap things in financial. It's only in financial markets that we have this problem. You know, when you go out shopping, you'll, you'll buy some cheap stuff, not a problem. But in markets, you can't, you can't do it. It's, uh, I, I challenge you. Uh, I, I challenge you. So now, um, mark, I'd say the currencies are fairly valued. So, so they're, we're OK. It's not cheap. It's not expensive. It's in the middle. What about a current account surplus? I think this is very important. Because normally, when we get into trouble, you look at the red arrow 97. We had a current account deficit. GFC, current account deficit. Taper tantrum 2013, current account deficit. Now. We have current account surpluses. It's a little bit of the prior discussion was about the current account surplus of, of most emerging markets in Asian countries. Um, someone has to run the deficit, and you know, right now the US is, and the UK is. Uh, and yeah, it's a different environment. It's very difficult to, to maintain this, given the, the, the politics of the situation. But both these lines uh, are telling me most countries have a current account surplus. Um, now. Our markets have changed completely in 10 years. Right, so if you look at this, is, I'm just doing the EM index, emerging markets. So back in the crisis, you know, 2007, 45% of our index was three sectors, energy, materials, and industrials, old economy stuff. Today, that's 19%. 10 years ago in 2007, technology was only 16% of our index. Now look at it, it's 40 in the US, technology is only 22% of the index. So it's quite interesting that emerging markets are a technology play. Right? We're, we're like the NASDAQ. We're, we're not old economy anymore. And a lot of this, obviously, is China. Uh, it's Taiwan. It's Korea, a little bit India. Uh, and I think this is where ASEAN uh, can do a lot better and get more technology into the index. Okay, so, so, so far I've talked about why emerging markets and Asian markets are in pretty good shape from an equity perspective. I said the valuations were reasonable. Um, I thought the financial vulnerability was very low. The earnings are going to be very, very good. And so it really should be a big part of your portfolio. And in Thailand, being an emerging market, I think will benefit from the global allocation to the asset class, which is just beginning. You know, for the last one year, I'd say our global clients have they've been underweight, and now they're reducing that underweight. Um, and I think they want to participate um, because you can see their you know, the U.S. market now is underperforming emerging in Asia by quite a big margin now. Um, okay. 
Now, this is very contentious, so uh, I'll spend some time talking about this. Inflation. So when you went to college, uh, you know, we all heard about the inflation in the 1970s. All the central bankers are very attuned to it. They don't like inflation. Um, and I think, like generals, they're fighting the last battle. So I'll give you my opinion, and then you, know, you, can, you can think about it and debate it and disagree with it. So I think inflation is going to be low for a very, very long time across the world. Um, and I'll give you some reasons why. So this is what I call Goldilocks, not too hot, not too cold. The lower line is the percentage of countries where inflation is rising, which would be hardly any. The yellow line is earnings, which is very strong. As an equity guy, I love it. Low inflation, strong earnings, I'm happy. No need for any more hard work. All that extra hard work is really, uh, you know, I don't know why, why people do it. If you, if you have this information, it's good enough to be bullish. You can, you can think about this, are these lines going to change, but incremental work is, I don't know what the benefits really are, apart from keeping you busy. Okay, so let's, let's look at inflation. So these are the forecasts of, I've just used the US as an example, of where inflation is expected to be, and then what actually happens. So just like analysts always say 10 to 13% for earnings, economists always say 2% for inflation. It's just a rule, right? But you can see the, the, the outcomes are a little bit different. Inflation has been much, much lower over time uh, since the crisis. Right? So it's an error. So you know, when I was younger, I used to be a good uh, marksman. But I was in India, so the, our rifles are from you know, 1940. Uh, so very ancient rifles. Um, so I would try to score the bullseye, but I would always shoot, because the rifle was like, it was bad. It would shoot three inches to the left. Uh, even though I was aiming for the bullseye. So my instructor kicked me, because you, know, you had to be in the prone position. He said, hey, can you, can you please shoot three inches to the right? Just do it, and then you'll hit the bullseye. So what, what the, the takeaway for this is, whatever you're saying for inflation, if you say two, I'll say 1.5. Uh, three inches to the right. right? So that's how you, <laughs> you have to make an adjustment. Uh, because if you know you're shooting in the wrong direction, you need to make a course correction. Same thing for bond yields. Uh, this is, so all these lines are colored spaghetti. These are with the bond yield forecasts over time. Yeah? So if you look at the first line, yellow line, black line, the bond yield is supposed to go up, but they keep going down. The next year, again, they're going to go up, but they keep going down. And rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. So, so whenever I ask somebody for a bond yield forecast, whatever you say, I'm going to take 20% away from it. Whatever you say. If you say three, I'll say oh, probably 2.2. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, and this, this should tell you that there is a bias, okay? So if I show this chart for you for, for Japan, it looks pretty much the same. I think you should just take a few seconds to think about this, because this is the most important factor in financial markets. What is the U.S. 10-year bond yield? Because it goes into all your credit analysis, it goes into your stock analysis. Remember, the rule is, whatever people are saying, take 20 to 30% off. And it doesn't rise. It keeps going down. So in Japan, I remember 1998. This is 19 years ago. What's your favorite short? Short the JGBs. This is 19 years ago. Those yields are now almost negative. So that shorting has not worked. Okay, why am I going on about this? Because it's all about inflation. So this is emerging market inflation. It's at a 20-year low. It's not developed. These are young countries. Inflation is very low. Percentage of developed countries where inflation is rising, basically zero. So it's falling everywhere. And I want to talk a bit about why, because uh, I think that's interesting. So one reason before I get into this chart, let's just go back one. One reason why there's no inflation is that in 1985, no developed country was old. Today, all of them are old. I can tell you this, it's very difficult for old people to generate inflation. Now think about it, think about what I said. Old, old countries find it super hard to generate inflation. And it's pretty logical. One, because old people don't buy property. They bought it when they were 30 to 40. So there's hardly any property cycle in old countries. There's hardly any credit cycle. Old people buy less stuff than when you're in your 30s and 40s. So there's less demand. 
So, so old people buy less stuff and less property. One reason. Reason number two, old people hopefully have some money. Yeah, they're long assets. They've, they've saved some money, they've got some assets. They like low inflation, so the value of assets can be high. And old people vote because they, they want to protect the value of their assets. So old people, like, like, like our Japanese friends, they like deflation. They won't tell you that. They like deflation. Because the value of the bond portfolio is pretty good. They keep selling stocks to foreigners. Yeah, yeah, you take it. We, we, we like our bonds. We keep shorting our bonds. Third factor is that old people don't kill each other. They, they don't go to war with each other. Very unusual for old people to, to go to war with each other. It's a young man's game. So if you think about old societies, less spending, a bias towards low inflation so the assets can inflate and they don't kill each other. Well, I'll be surprised, and, and they vote. They never forget to, to vote, yeah? they always do it. That's, these are the, some of the reasons why inflation is low. Now, let me give you some other reasons. You know, financial crisis, you're very familiar in Thailand after 97, a financial crisis is a way to sweep away the inefficient and the weak. That's the role of a crisis. So now we've had a crisis in the West 10 years ago in Europe and the US, and a consequence of that crisis is that, assume there are like 50 sectors in each country in the US and Europe, if you look at the middle bar, 69%, so that's almost 70% of European sectors have higher oligopoly power, means that they have uh, more market dominance. So there are fewer airlines, there are fewer investment banks, there are fewer train companies, fewer chemical companies, because the weak are gone. Not all of them, but many of them. So. The Western world, the US and Europe, the red bars on the right-hand side, are very oligopolistic, a lot of market power, very powerful. When we are, and you've read this in your high school and, and college books, that when you're a monopoly, when you're an oligopoly, you have higher margins. We know this, yeah? This, even for those of us like me who weren't paying attention, this is, we remember this part. Oligopolies have higher margins, and so you pay a higher multiple for those. The unfortunate part, if you're a worker, is there's a negative relationship between oligopoly power and wage growth. So I don't know how many of you, I don't know what the situation here is, but uh, it's very hard if you work in an investment bank to go to your boss and say, I'm, I'm such a hero, you need to pay me a lot more money. I'm just like that, you know, just you gotta pay. Uh, you could have said that before the crisis and gotten away with it. You can't right now because it's an oligopoly. Where are you going to go? Yeah, there's only three or four key players. So there's a negative relationship between lots of oligopolies and, and wage growth. If you don't have wage growth, it's very hard to generate inflation. Okay? Last point on inflation is that a lot of people are working as consultants in their pajamas, in their mom's basement. So, after the crisis. So these guys have less bargaining power than all you folks who are sitting in you know, suits and ties. And you're working for a company as a regular job, you have some bargaining power. If you're an Uber driver, you're a barista, you're working three jobs, a lot of income insecurity, you don't have any wage power. So. So what I'm talking about here is many different forces at work, the gig economy, aging, uh, globalization, technological disruption, uh, oligopoly power, that means that wage growth is gonna be super slow. That's the conundrum that central bankers are trying to figure out. And I th I've tried to provide some answers. So if I'm right, if I'm right, then inflation is gonna remain very, very low for a very, very long time. Okay, just some quick thoughts on Thailand. Uh, so Thailand is a valuation. Uh, you can see it's in the middle, so it's not an expensive market and price to book. The PE is a little bit higher, it's about 14 times. One of the, the bad things about uh, what, what's happening in the local market is the red line. So unlike the other emerging markets, where I showed you the earnings numbers are going up, here the earnings expectations have come down. 
So 14 times PE, seven, eight times earnings growth, 7% uh, earnings growth is uh, a little bit challenging uh, compared to the other countries. Uh, but having said that, the macro part is actually looking pretty good. So if you look at the bottom left chart, that's the current account. I mean, it is unbelievable. It's 10% of GDP. Uh, really, really strong. Uh, look at the chart on the top left, loan growth. Look at the middle part of that chart as pre-crisis. You know, three-year loan growth of 75%. Um, we know what happened after that. So now it's much more reasonable. Um, look at the bottom right chart, short-term debt divided by reserves. You look at the mid-90s, it was over 100%. More short-term debt than overall reserves. It's a recipe for trouble. Right now, not a problem. So I think Thailand is a good example of other emerging markets also where, where the macro fundamentals are actually quite strong. Um, and many other countries also look very similar. So let me just summarize what I've said so far. Um, very bullish on Asia and emerging markets. I think the valuations are reasonable. The macro fundamentals are very strong. The earnings should grow about 20% this year, probably about 15% next year. Um, I think there's some very good companies. The structure of the market has changed dramatically in favor of technology, which are you know, growth companies. Um, in terms of China, I think I didn't really talk too much about it, but my, my conclusion is it's becoming a very new economy-oriented country, where, where technologies and, and the new sectors like consumer services, defense, healthcare are becoming very, very big. Big taxpayers, big employers, big investors. Um, and so try not to focus so much on their debt problem um, and, uh, and their old economy. Uh, try to focus more on their new economy, which I think is doing very, very well. I think they've got policy under control also. And, and the last fact I wanted to highlight was that I think inflation and interest rates are going to remain lower for longer. And I think that's going to be very good for anything that's a carry trade or, or a risk asset. Warren, I stop here uh, and wish you the best for your investments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. RJ, for an insightful session. So, ladies and gentlemen, today's seminar has come to an end. There are interesting seminars lining up for tomorrow's conference. The first session will start at 9.30 a.m. So, have a good day, everyone, and see you again tomorrow. Thank you very much. Kha.